free to disturb the speaker, that's right. Um, okay, so this is from Helpers to Middleware. Um, I think most of you have already had the unpleasant experience of meeting me. That's my internet avatar. Um, I review a lot of code, um, and I work for this company called Rove, so we're consultants. What does a consultant do? Well, we take out your money and we spend it to go to conferences. It works well so far. So, um, this is a bit of a meta talk. It doesn't have any practical advice. It's more about like a direction. Where do we want to go? Let's start from where we were. Um, I started coding PHP somewhat somewhere after the Millennium Bug. Um, so let's go back in history and you go back to your first website. Who made the first website in the first 2000s? Who's newer than that? Ah, oh, okay, there's still a lot of people. Um, right, so websites were relatively easy. It was like, oh yes, I know HTML, I can put it on just CDs, I'm gonna put the work in progress, and that's it, right? But there's an amazing website by Adidas, I noticed last day, the last day is the pretty much a bit so we have some tools. They're not the best tools. It's like mostly Notepad and some simple text editors. The first IDs were already popping up because there were more mature languages. But we got some customers. Customers that want our products. They're not the best customers, but they got the money. We want to do the job. So yeah, we're going to do it, regardless how good or bad it looks. So just a word of warning. There's gonna be a lot of shitty code. So, uh, I just got LASIK, so I'm scared of looking at the screen because it's gonna ruin my eyes again. Um, but yes, so of course, every project, well, at least for me, started with this. Uh, I didn't even know about register globals, honestly. So, yes, we did this thing because, yeah, variables are tedious, and of course, we're gonna. We're gonna get everything from request. We don't care if it's get, post, whatever. Everything from the request, right? And uh, we start with this. And what is interesting about this is the first line up there. Functions.inc.php. Sometimes even functions.inc. Or php, sorry, config.inc was amazing, where you can just browse the web and look for old websites that have config.inc, then connect to their database, because it just works. And yeah, so this was our startup script. And then we have our main application. It was all squashed together. Um, yeah, it's all in one place. This is our business logic, rendering, everything in one place. And honestly, I put it quite nicely because lots of people uh, coded stuff like if variable is true and then two lines above, there's variable equal true and stuff like that. So yeah, we were quite bad at coding. So of course, if we are sending some request and the type is purchase, remember that this is a parameter that came in for from the request. And the user type is Coyote. Again, may well be in the URL, doesn't matter. Then we just select some stuff. Of course, we fetch whatever came from the request, put it in an SQL query. That's fine. Um, I mean, it needs to work. It doesn't need to be perfect, right? And yes, of course, there's a big mistake here, which is that they forgot to add the or die, my SQL error. I mean, how are you supposed to, to understand why your website is not working otherwise, right? And uh, then, of course, we fetch some data, and uh, then we add some validation. Of course, the credit card number got submitted as one of the parameters. So if it is a purchase and the credit card is not empty, which is more than sufficient as a validation rule, because the validation was done somewhere in the front end, right? Um, that the success is true. The success is true, right? It makes sense. Okay, this is like true, define true, false, or something like that. It can't happen anyway. And then we do, uh, well, yes, okay, imagine success, false, yeah. Then we do an insert uh, with the values. Again, just put them in, doesn't matter. Of course, save the credit card, very important. And then we send our email that the purchase succeeded. And maybe we send it to our system, to the customer system, doesn't matter. Maybe fax it. And then we have our template. So 
I was nice here. I put the template in a separate file, but we know, all of us know, that it was all put together in one file, everything there. And yes, we even have a header and footer separate, so we're not even duplicating everything. This is stuff that we used to do with Dreamweaver. You had the header and the footer somewhere, and Dreamweaver would upload the files after pre-processing and stuff like that. Dreamweaver was awesome. Okay, so of course, if the success does not exist, right, then you exit. Makes your application, again, easy to debug, right? And of course, this application has a strong security layer. Yeah, right. Just like, uh, you know, JavaScript void. That was the security layer at the time. We didn't know any better. That's fine. Projects used to be easy. The customer came in, they just wanted something done, something quick. Maybe they wanted a counter on a web page. Everyone put the counter on a web page. Now you look back at it and you notice how depressing that is when your web page after 10 years has a thousand visits. It makes you really depressed. But still, they used to be easy. It used to be simple stuff. And effectively, the point was just getting it done. It was not about getting it done safely. Uh, so yeah, we just did whatever we did to do. We relied a lot on globals. We just fetch things from somewhere. The connection, the database connection is available. Somebody else provided it to us. Some parameters already exist. We don't check if they exist or not. We assume things. The, the keyword is assumption. There is something somewhere. We rely on it to exist. And if it doesn't, it crashes. And if it crashes, we don't even know about it because we didn't have any better tooling. And the point is this, this functions dot .inc, .php .inc, of course, ends with dot .inc. Um, this is the birth of the helper, in my opinion. The helper is kind of this idea that you want to do something that has nothing to do with the current script, but you want to do it in a clean way. So yeah, try to extract it, make it a bit more reusable. It was all about reducing the amount of copy paste. There was no testing. There was no real clean code idea. Yes, there were books about it, but they were mostly unknown. I think clean code was 1998, the first version. So yeah, people learned how to read later, right? Um, so the point is clients will pay for this. They don't care. They want their restaurant page up. They want their hotel page up. It's all about having your website up there. If you don't have a website, you're nobody. And effectively, they will also have to pay for a rewrite because every time you have to change, I don't know, agency, you have to change the person that wrote all this thing. It's so hard to understand what this is all about. There is no way to look at back at the code that you already have and understand what it's doing without going crazy, right? And invoking some kind of evil god that helps you debug it or something, right? So a few years later, a few years later, I think six years later or something like that, um, first, I would say, decent frameworks started to pop up. I don't consider WordPress a decent framework, don't get me wrong. It's useful. I don't think you should build anything on it besides a blog. Um, so a few years later, the first frameworks came up and um, of course, this framework authors, they knew what was going on. Yeah, we still know everything about everything, right? And everything we write is correct. And yes, of course, they made a lot of mistakes, a lot of assumptions. They just coded things that were being done in the wild into the framework abstractions. But the point is now, one very important thing that happened is that concerns were being separated. So what framework authors did, is they took this concept called MVC, right? They butchered it, they destroyed it, ruined it, made it terrible, well, whatever. No, they actually took the good bits, I think. Um, and they made an MVC-ish architecture. So if you went to a conference in 2010 or something like that, it was all about MVC, 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 MVC. How does MVC work? And um, what does MVC do and so on? And MVC does not really work over HTTP. It was a pattern designed for UIs, so that if you update something here, it shows up here immediately. Uh, so it doesn't really make sense for HTTP because if something changes on the server, the client doesn't care because there's no synchronous communication. And um, yeah, 
still, we got this separation. So what happened is that we started introducing this thing called controllers. I wouldn't even say that people started introducing models because everything was a model apparently, but um, they started introducing this controller, which is at least some kind of isolation of what is going on. So now we've got this purchase controller. Of course, of course, the purchase controller extends from the framework. Everything comes with the framework. The framework gives us all the useful stuff right, for maximum coupling. It makes it compatible. It makes it easy for the junior to understand the framework later on and to understand your application. It is still true. If you go and look at an application that was written with a framework back in 2008, you would still say it's terrible, but at least you can follow it. Whereas previously, it was like really proper garbage everywhere. And right, now our action has a name. We gave it a name, we are purchasing something. It's no longer like a script that includes the purchase plus the viewing of the purchase plus everything else in one place. Now we have some security. We have, what, what happened here is the first call to a helper. This is Coyote. I don't know where it is defined, but it is one of these helpers of the framework. It now makes a bit more sense and we can stop the execution in here. And by the way, yes, I use the return. A lot of people still used exit here, but still, this is a bit more manageable. And then we got some data validation done relatively well. Anybody know what CSRF is, right? Who learned it from a framework? That's the point. Every one of you learned it basically from a framework. You didn't read about CSRF and went on implementing CSRF validators yourself. And that's kind of the cool thing. So you are uh, transmitting a lot of knowledge about how applications should be done through the tooling. Not necessarily good, but still better than what was happening before. Now we have a database abstraction. So we are loading some product uh, and we're doing some magic with it. Yes, again. I'm making it much nicer than how it was in theory because you still had SQL queries here and there. But now the risk of SQL injection was reduced massively. And the rendering is done in a separate layer in a template. And you could swap out this template so that if it was Christmas, you could finally swap out and use the other template that has you know, the, uh, the snow coming down, right? Everyone did that. You have to have snow at Christmas. That was progress. And what is mostly important here is that we started having some security problems solved by our tooling. We started fixing XSS by having escaping provided by our frameworks, by our tooling, form validation, tokens for CSRF, for other things. I wouldn't even say tokens for APIs. It was not yet the age of APIs. APIs came 2013, 2014. That's when people started discussing APIs, data access layers for avoiding SQL injections, and we start using a real mailer abstraction so we don't have a typical header injection in emails. Because if you allow any string to go into your headers, well, good luck with that. Um, we still rely a lot on these helpers. So the helper in this case is somewhere in the base controller. And what happens in the base controller is this, we have our call, which is a magic method. We give it the name of the helper, and then we have some sort of registry that fetches the helper by name and calls it. So this is all done statically. We didn't know any better. And effectively, if you went to a conference, it was about design patterns, and every talk about design patterns started with the singleton pattern. And that's where it all go, uh, well, kind of went south there. So we are using registries. Registries look good, um, but they're no better than global variables. So does anybody recognize this particular piece of code? Don't tell me where it comes from. Do you recognize where this comes from? Right, I will not tell that. But it's just a tip, it's not from 2007. We still keep doing that sort of stuff and it's not really okay. So the other problem is that users don't really read the advice that is given by people on forums. They just read the documentation, the first two pages of the documentation, right? The rest is just like, I'll figure it out. And they go on and implement everything and everything is in the controller. 
It's still better than before, but it's all in the controller, right? And we're coupling everything with the framework again. Um, plus, the framework has this singleton kernel, so it's impossible to swap something out. If you wanted to replace how forms work it in your framework, you would probably invent half the framework yourself and you know invent weird conventions to make it work. And then you had to make all these zero argument classes because we didn't really understand what dependency injection was. So all your classes had to have zero argument constructors in order to be instantiable from anywhere. They would have to fetch the database connection statically internally. So the problem propagated itself. It made itself worse naturally. And then we used autoloading as a service location. At least we have autoloading. Autoloading came in and we could use it and that's already good. Still, then came the next wave, the next big thing, which was testing in my opinion. Anybody tried testing with us in Framework 1 application? Right? Was it fun? No, it was not. And that's because all these limitations, these, these things that make it, make it easy to work with, make it very, very hard to solve this um, replacement and, uh, and uh, testability issues. What happened then is that we had another wave of frameworks. This is 2012. 2012 is when Symfony 2 came out, then Framework 2 came out. I think a new version of K came out. Uh, it was an interesting year, right? And a lot was moving. We um, were going and replacing all of these bad ideas that we found and piece by piece getting it out, removed from the system, removed from the ecosystem and, and looking at how we can make it clear to the user that some of these ideas, while useful, were actually causing other problems downstream. So here is a controller after that. Um, I wouldn't argue that this is simpler, um, but it is at least explicit. So we are still extending from the framework, from the base controller, but now we have these properties. These properties are now the security check, the purchase form, product repository, authentication, notifications. Um, and we start introducing this idea of service service-oriented architecture, which doesn't mean that you have to talk with SOAP to another service, and it doesn't mean that you have to use a microservice. Please don't use a microservice. Um, but now we have all the constructor arguments there, and it's very clear to understand what this thing will need in order to function. And after that, the code even shrinks a bit. You now fetch some information, you add an assertion, right? You have some relatively testable code. And it's very magic-less. There's very little magic, it's easy to follow. Uh, there's very little framework-specific things that are not part of the language. So far, so good. Looks good. Progress. There's still a lot of framework coupling, though. And if you're doing a lot of this, and every framework has its own version of a controller, and its own abstraction of a request and its own definitions of how to make a helper and so on, uh, you are going to still end up with a rewrite every time you do an upgrade. So um, a lot of thinking got into this and a lot of people started reasoning mostly about uh, dependency injection, about testability and test-driven development, we had a lot of ORMs being introduced. We had the rise of DDD that happened 2014, 2015, something like that. And we had a lot of these, right? TDD, DI, or DDD, and so on. That was a push forward. Now you are required to you know, have clear dependencies. You are hopefully going to define how, what your domain looks like. We are not talking about now, we are talking about what, three years ago, four years ago, right? I'm not expecting every one of you to know this, but these are concepts that were introduced a lot of time ago, and you should study them if you never heard of them. So please, if you are confused or if you need any guidance, please come and ask a question. Right, we had then another evolution. Another evolution, which was the introduction of what I would call the middleware. 
And the middleware was initially designed by Igor Widler. Um, and he was designing a thing called stack PHP, which is just requests going in and responses coming out. And layer by layer, every layer is able to do its own decision about it. The abstraction is pretty much like this. When you go and you need to travel via plane, you go to the airport, you check in, you drop your bags, then you go through security, then you board the plane, then there is the actual flight, and you go back, you leave the plane, go through security on the other side, and get your bag again. This is exactly how HTTP works. It's not just in PHP that HTTP works like that, it's also how it works outside your server. You got a reverse proxy, you got a proxy on the other side, you got a firewall. There's the network layer, and so on and so forth. And all these layers can take decisions, redirect you, and if you're like in China, they can do magic with your requests and introduce everything in your request. It's not necessarily positive, but they can do a lot of interesting stuff. Right. So what happened is that we got rid of a bunch of decisions. So now we got this purchase action. I call it action. It is one of these middleware. It has its dependencies, so we still got these properties. But now the actual interaction is this. It is a function, a function that receives a request and gives us a response, because that's what we do in HTTP. And it's not really worth designing abstractions for other things if we are doing HTTP for 99.9% .9 of our time. So a request comes in, response goes out. And what we do here is we just fetch some data from the request that is already pre-processed for us and we do what is actually important. So we get the product, purchase the product, or whatever it is, doesn't need to be done like that. And then you send some notification and then you render the response. So we are doing just what is to be done in this particular context. And then we have a separate middleware, right? It's like in layers, every layer does one thing. This one says only Coyotes. Only Coyotes can perform this particular kind of request. So what we receive, well, sorry, it's, it's the same thing, right? Constructor, very clean dependency injection. And then we have this invoke function. And in the invoke function here, we say if the user, well, well, I got a typo there, but whatever. If the user is a Coyote and then return, okay, perform the next operation. Otherwise, we are going to show you an error page and you cannot continue, right? If it is a successful case, then you just go to the next middleware. You just go to the next step. So you can put this thing in front of anything that requires you to be a Coyote in order to perform purchase of whatever explosives you prefer. And then you can do an only authenticated, right? If you go back here, how do you get if it is a coyote? You need to get this request attribute that says you are a coyote, right? In order to do that, you need to perform some authentication. So the authentication layer is get a user from some cookie, which is the request headers and so on. And if the user is authenticated and go to the next one, next layer, 931 here, otherwise uh, render an error page and say, nope, you're not allowed here. And right. And then you got um, another middleware that says only with valid form data. What does this do? Again, takes the request, takes the parameters, verifies if the parameters are valid, I'm using this list invalid valid syntax here in order to decide if it's if it's a valid request or not and also get the valid information. If it is invalid, then I'm going to show you an error page again. Otherwise, I'm going to the next handler again, step by step by step. And my application is now a relatively simple pipe. That's what we call it at least. It's a middleware pipe where you say, you are only there allowed if you're authenticated. Then after you're authenticated, you're only authorized if you're a coyote. After that, you need to have submitted some valid form data and then you can perform a purchase. 
Okay, so my purchase now is very isolated to just what is important. And then the rest is mostly layers of decisions about things that are common to most of my application. So I am a bit of a Haskell nut these days. Uh, it looks like this. If you abstract it more and more, effectively you got a request and a response. That's your application. And the application is just make a request and pipe it through the first layer, then the second layer, then the third layer, then the fourth layer. And suddenly at some point you get a response. And each of those can stop the execution and re respond with a response that is not the 200. So this is what is provided by the various PSR standards, right? PSR 0 and PSR 4 are just the enablers that started all of this and it allowed frameworks to, I would say, thrive. Composer came back in 2013 and changed almost everything with it, with PHP. But then these PSR 7, PSR 15, and PSR 11 allow you to define packages that consume each other not just from a class level. As I said, classes um, are statically coupled. We have this zero argument constructor rule. It doesn't really work. No, we need a bit more than that. So we can start defining containers. And I can say, my package will give you a mailer. My package will give you a service that does geolocation, and so on and so forth. PSR7 is a nice abstraction of HTTP requests. Um, a relatively good one, since it's immutable, or most of it is immutable. And PSR15 is this middleware abstraction. And suddenly what happens is that our code can be frameworkless. There's no frameworks anymore in my code. Anybody know this framework in my examples before of this middleware? There was nothing from the framework. So the point is we got to kill the framework. Um, and this is good. I was mostly against this because a lot of people um, pretty much learned a lot from frameworks, but it is also true that you can fetch yourself your own version of whatever framework you want now, and if it is supporting these standards, these PSR standards, especially PSR 15, then you can swap it out with whatever you want at any time, and you don't have that rewrite problem. The framework is the framework of a structure. Once you've completed a building like this one, well, this one still has some frames up there, but you shouldn't see it anymore. You shouldn't see the frames anymore. It's somewhere in the structure, and you shouldn't care about it. And of course, it doesn't work like this in construction, but if I change framework, I shouldn't have to rewrite the entire thing. And I'm going to reduce that risk by moving to abstractions that make more sense in the HTTP world and are better suited for business logic. What happened also is that we started pushing immutability a lot. PSRs, PSR7 specifically, um, pushes these Im immutable request objects, which are very useful for pushing around data without having to wonder where or who changed this particular request. We started pushing values, value types, value objects. Value objects came up in PHP ages ago, but um, pretty much started becoming hip a couple years ago, three, four years ago, mostly. And uh, yeah, a value object looks like this. You have a user ID. User ID previously would just be an integer. Instead, here you have this class thing, and it has one constructor. And what you do is you code the invariance, the decisions around a value inside the value, and you reject anything that is not acceptable. So this kind of structure, while it may look like overhead, gives you a lot of safety about what you can do with your application. And that's just value objects. And then the other thing you gain from this is that suddenly your application is no longer everything strings, everything integers, and just functions that pass arrays to arrays and so on and so forth. But you got types. And types gives you type give you the ability to use static analysis. And static analysis prevents you from ever swapping these two parameters. Before pushing this code to production, you know if it will work or not. That's the point. You know before if it will crash without having to look at it up front. Static analysis is something that came um, up mostly last year in PHP, I think. 
at least it became more mainstream. So we started having tools like Exacat, PHP Stan, uh, Psalm, and so on. And they are also one of the biggest changes in the last couple of years. And it is one of the biggest pushes for having more typed applications, having more information about what we are dealing with instead of how we are dealing with it. And then maybe at some point we'll have generics, maybe generics, see what I did there. Uh, um, so we're pushing towards types, we're pushing immutability. This is the way that functional programming does it. Uh, for those that don't know functional programming, functional programming is programming without variables, which is a bit strange. You don't have variables, you don't have mutable things in functional programming. Um, that's the simple explanation. Please don't take it as an official explanation. So what happens is that my middleware there, they had a construct and an invoke. How do you call them? Anybody know how you call them? A function, yes. More specifically? A v, sorry. A callable, yes. It is specifically, it's a curried function. So it's a function that already knows about some context. That's what construct plus invoke gives us. Let me put it a bit more in context. You have a function that takes a database and a command called create users and create some user data and there's nothing at the end, right? It just disappears in the void. And you can reduce this function to just user data in IO because you already gave it the database. That's the idea behind it. Let me write it in PHP so that everyone understands it. You have a register user, you receive a database and a create user service. You give it some user data and it does some registration. That's what it looks like in PHP. And if we simplify it further, you have a function called register user, which receives a database and a create user and some user data, right? And if we simplify it further, we can curry it. So a constructed function is curry of register user with the parameters db and create user already pre-filled. That's what this constructor is doing. This constructor and this curry thing here are the same thing, which is quite interesting. So we are pushing functional patterns. We're not really realizing it, but it's just because we are reducing the amount of things that we are moving at runtime, and we're more defining where are things before we run it at all. And we can push these functional patterns even in the storage. So lately, over the last couple of years, I've been interested a lot in event sourcing. And event sourcing means that instead of saving and updating in a database and losing information every time you update and having to design a, um, a log for everything that changes because nobody understands anymore who changed what, you have this event sourcing thing that stores information as events. So you have a run action. The run action takes a list of events, something that you want to happen, and gives you a new list of events. That's what event sourcing is. And if you curry it, it's load history and run the command. This is most likely or probably the death of the ORM pattern uh, because it is so powerful that you rarely need an ORM to make it to make things happen anymore. Um, so if you glue everything together, well, it, it's not the death of the ORM, by the way, we're still maintaining that stuff and we're still using it where it makes sense, right? Don't panic. But you should look into this because it's so damn powerful. It gives you so much more insights, but that's for a different talk. Um, now you can pipe everything together. Let's say that you take event sourcing, you take middleware, you take functional patterns, and you pipe everything together. And what you get at the end is something like this. You add your application at the top, takes a request and a response. And this is an HTTP application. That's our definition of it. Then you say, for the post interaction on the purchase action, then you want to pipe it through the only with authentication layer, right? So the data flows from one function to the next one and eventually stops and goes and returns something early instead. And then you got only the authenticated coyotes can access this. And then you go on and you say only with valid form data. Cool, you keep going. And then you say, 
you take that form and translate it into something that makes more sense because forms are usually framework specific and that's still something to solve. Uh, so if somebody has ideas on how to make forms framework agnostic, please do tell. And then you keep on going and you say, load the history from the database, right? And then you say, perform the purchase from that history. And then you got your new history, right? So you store the new history into the database. And at the end, you say, take the history that you created and transform it into a response, which is I purchased the product or I purchased the product and I gave you also discount. So, of course, this is very meta. This is written in a different language, but this is easily translated to PHP. There's no more service location. We don't fetch things at runtime. We have a clear definition of what comes in, what is required. There's no more helpers. Things that happen in between, randomly. We made them explicit. We made them part of our execution steps. And the definition of our application, this definition of our application is easy to understand. If you read it, you understand what the application is doing. There's no like, uh, sorry, I need to understand what this for each is doing before I tell you what the code is actually doing. This code is understandable. The cross counting concerns become just part of the functional composition. We are composing functions together for the Haskell nuts. This is just monadic bind that we're using. But we don't have shared mutable state anymore. The a-falses are gone. There's no shared mutable state. There's no hidden state happening at runtime. We gave the application everything it needed before. So the point is we are moving to functional programming. And good object-oriented programming is damn close to object-oriented programming. So to, to functional programming, sorry. Um, so if we move in that direction more and more and we apply the solid principles to extremes, we end up with something that really resembles functional programming. I think that's the right direction. I think this is a good idea to study and pursue these ideas. So what is coming up next? What's coming up next is not something I can tell you. It is something that you have to research. If you are contributing to libraries, to ideas, to frameworks, please do come, open a discussion, figure out what can we do to make things clearer, to make things more immutable, less hard to debug, and so on. And hopefully your idea will spawn the next revolution. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Wait, please. Wait. Yeah, it's fine. You can repeat the question. Ah, okay. Oh, that's. Hello. Yeah, speak to the box. Okay. So, uh, GDD, and you have middleware. Does it mean that you can? <laughs> does it not? Okay. You hear me, right? Good. Yes. Okay. So, I wouldn't repeat. So, uh, GDD, middleware, etc. So, will you go from application to infrastructure to business domain logic? Can it be done, let's say, with middleware? Because what actually yes, is actually it can be done with the middleware. The last middleware is going to be your last step before you jump into the main. Okay, but what about with actually changing the data? Because like on applications, it's a complete it's a request. On the infrastructure, it might be, I don't know, something like to chase action. Yeah. So, so we actually change it on the way of the middleware. So it's not, let's, let's say, a request response to HTTPSR 7. It's more like on the highest level with middleware with request response on the, like, Coming back to the core logic, it's purchase action. And no, no, no. Let me let me make one thing here the, clear here. The these 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 helpers that take decisions before you get to do the actual important stuff, they were always infrastructural components. They were not doing important things. So all we are doing is transforming them into something that is more manageable, and it mo is more explicit at application declaration. Uh, the domain part, which is not covered in this talk, by the way, it's just like extracted. I'm, I'm assuming that the domain part is happening somewhere. Um, let me see if I can find uh, a good example. Yes, this purchase with user 927. It happens in there. That's the mine stuff. Everything else is just gluing things together, except that we're doing it in a more manageable way. 
and we're moving more towards functional patterns. Inside there, maybe, then there is the entire CQRS, whatever you want to do, doesn't matter. This is just about the outside layers. We're doing everything with this HTTP and we're taking decisions about security, about uh, authentication, authorization, validation of data, and so on. And these decisions are mostly done by gluing together some framework and maybe having some magic with some annotations somewhere right now. And frankly, if you were to debug something like that, you would go crazy, right? And this makes it a bit easier to deal with. One thing that is missing to make it easier to deal with is proper tooling support. So you need to start from the frameworks and build the thing that makes sense in this kind of piping architecture. And after you got that, you can maybe introduce things like debugging tools that can record the steps. For example, in JavaScript, Cycle.js has such tools where you can run something and figure out all the history of all the mutations of a value inside a chain of uh, possible actions. And that's where we probably need some research by the community, people that look into it and figure out what to do next there. Any other questions? PHP, I don't see PHP traits. I, I don't think PHP traits are a good piece of design. Uh, I used to like them when they came out in PHP 5.4. Then I used them for like two weeks and I stopped because they didn't make any sense. Most applications where I saw traits are very, very hard to figure out from a coding point of view because now you are doing jumps across contexts that are not necessarily together until at runtime. So traits are compiler aided copy paste and copy paste should just be done. If you need to copy paste, just copy paste it. As soon as you got a trait, what happens is that you, you use this trait in five, six, seven location, right? Then you got to fix a bug and the bug is in the trait. And you fix the trait and you break one of those five, six implementations because that one specific implementation was relying on it. That's not really nice. So instead of using a trait, which is very similar to a helper actually, um, use functional composition, uh, most traits can be converted to uh, static helpers that don't use static state. Please don't use static state. Static properties don't do that. But uh, you have this trait that helps you define if a user is of a certain type that could be a function on its own. It could be a function on the user, right? a method on the user type, and so on. It doesn't need to be the trait. Any other questions? Right, food seems like a good plan. All right, thank you. <laughs>